Hi, I'm John Strohmeyer. I'm an attorney in Texas focused on estate planning and tax laws where we help our clients leave no unfinished business. Now, I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. Remember, this is all for fun and entertainment. Don't just trust some talking head on the internet when it comes to your situation. Talk to your own advisor to make sure you're getting good advice for your situation. Today, we're gonna to be talking about questions about probate because we wanna know, well, once you're gone, what's going to come up? What is your family going to have to deal with as they resolve any unfinished business you may have left for them? So with that in mind, let's get to some of those questions that people have sent in to us. First question, where does the probate process here occur here in Texas? When we think about probate, it means a bunch of different things, even state to state, the word probate can have different meanings. So first things, we need to think about. If there's a last will, Texas law requires that that last will be sent and filed with the county clerk. This is just to make sure if there's a will, we're putting it where everybody can find it, you know, kind of keep open transparency for everybody. This is the document we have. We want to make sure everybody has a chance to see what it says. Even if we're not going to go through a court uh, process, even if we're not going to have an executor or an administrator appointed, the will is filed with the county clerk. If you're in California, they actually call this process lodging the will with the county clerk, but the idea is the same. And as far as I know, all of the states have a, a similar requirement. If there's a last will, you send the original to the county clerk so everybody can see it. It's just out there, even if you're not going to do any formal administration. Well, okay, well, we've got that part down. If there's a will, you send it to the county clerk. Next step, determine if you're going to be going through any sort of court process. And so the probate process then moves from the county clerk's office to the probate or uh, other county court office or the county court chambers. Once you're there, what are we doing? Well, that's where we're determining one, probate means to prove. So we're proving up that this last will is actually the original one. It is the correct will. This is the one that's going to govern the distribution of assets for the estate. So there's that level of probate. We're going to be in the judge. We'll be in the court. We're going to uh, prove that last will up that it is the original and it is the correct will. Where we go from there depends. You know, we've got this, we've got a muniment of title proceeding. That muniment of title says the will is original. We don't need a formal administration. So we're not going to actually have anything else done. The will is proved. Here's an order that says, if you need to go collect assets, use this as your authority, but we're not going to have an executor or an administrator. Beyond that, well, we may need an executor or an administrator appointed. So we're still in the courtroom. We're going to have someone appointed as that fiduciary to administer the estate. Well, now that we're out of court, what are we going to do? Yes, we'll have some other paperwork we need to file along the way, but let's put that to the side. Now we're out in the wide world. Probate is out here, you know, out here, everywhere else, we're going to be collecting assets. So we're, you know, the probate process means we're going to be going to banks, financial institutions, custodians, life insurance companies, picking up the phone, calling them, logging in through the websites to collect those assets. Even if we don't have a formal administration, you want to go get your stuff. You want to go get the decedent stuff so you can transfer it on to somebody else. So there we are. We're going to be going to wherever those custodians are. It may also mean that we're going to some other government offices, you know, tax office, uh, county clerk for filing property records. We're going to be transferring assets. You know, if we've got title to a car, well, we need to make sure that we're transferring it to the next person, getting title from the decedent's name into somebody else's name. So where does the probate process occur? Formally, it's going to be between the county clerk and the courtroom for what we think of as you know, traditional probate. But once you're done with those portions, we're going to be out collecting assets, making distributions. It really will be, you know, once we've got the authority to transition assets, we're going to be doing probate. We're going to be collecting those assets, paying off any remaining debts, and then transitioning them to the beneficiaries, well, out here in the wide world. So lots of places, but it all has a kind of similar starting point. Let's go to the next next question. 
do I have to pay any income tax during probate? And so, yeah, this is kind of a complicated answer. It's kind of something people don't think about. All right, well, while you're alive, you're having to pay income tax. We all have to pay income tax. There's no magic trick. There's you know not one weird trick that exempts your income from tax while you're alive. Once you pass, though, well, what happens? You're Obviously, you're not earning anymore. That W-2 wage income isn't going to be coming in anymore. Whatever that final paycheck, if you have one, that would go on your final income tax return. It'll be the job of whoever's left, executor or an administrator, or if you're not doing a formal administration, somebody's going to have to file that last income tax return with the IRS just to let them know, hey, you know, so-and-so has passed on. We're not going to be filing a fi any more income tax returns for them. Kind of close things out. But occasionally you'll get estates where they're still earning income. You can imagine if somebody owned rental real estate, if they had investments, even though they've passed, they still have stuff that generates income. Well, they can't file a 1040 anymore. They're not alive. We've got a final day of when they earn that income. What will end up happening is we're filing a 1041. This is an estate or trust tax income tax return. These are there because the rules are different when you have a fiduciary involved. Whether it's a trust or a state, they're going to have their own income tax return that gets filed. And so what we're thinking about is, well, we're going to have to file that return, report the income generated by the estate to the extent that the estate doesn't pay income tax on that. Well, that's because the income was distributed out to a bear, a beneficiary or an heir, not a bear, just combining terms. And then the beneficiary or the heirs will pick up that income and report it on their own income tax returns. So yes, we do have to pay income tax during probate. We do still have that obligation to file. You know, Just because there's a trust or an estate, it doesn't mean they don't pay income tax. You know, Estates are tax-paying entities. Trusts, you're either a grantor trust, a simple trust, or a complex trust. You'll be paying income tax one way or another with those trusts. So yes, when you look at it, we do have income tax to pay during probate. You're going to be filing IRS Form 1041 to report the estate's income and pay tax on it to the extent it is not distributed out to a beneficiary or an heir. Let's go to the next question. How long does probate take here in Texas? Well, lawyer answer, it's going to depend on what we need to do. If there's no will and we have to find heirs, we have to find assets, it could take years. Normally, when there's not a last will, I'm typically telling our clients, it, you should plan on it being at least six months before we get to the court for our first hearing to prove up who those heirs are. So, you know, that's, that's bad news. If we've got a last will, but we're filing an estate tax return, probate could still take a year or more because we're going to be putting all the information together for that in or for the estate tax return. It just takes time. And so it doesn't mean that we're slow going or nothing's happening. It just means we've got things to do. We're working on other things that draw the probate process out. You know, the process of not just signing and filing things with the court, but wrapping up a loved one's final tasks. You know, what unfinished business do we have? On the other end, sometimes it is pretty quick. It is possible to use beneficiary designations to transfer assets immediately. You know, we don't have any probate process that needs to be court mediated. So if your assets pass by beneficiary designation to somebody, there's nothing to do. If the beneficiary has capacity, if they can collect those assets by themselves, we don't need to go to court. You know, the moment you have that death certificate and photo ID for the beneficiary of those estates, they can collect it and move on. If all we have is a car that we need to transition and there's no other estate administration, we don't need a formal airship declaration, there are forms that you can use to transition a car using an affidavit of airship. For real estate, I don't like skipping over an actual airship process. There are enough title companies out there that will say, look, yeah, you can file an affidavit of airship when somebody has passed, but we're not going to accept it. Uh, we just, we don't think that's good enough. We want you to go through an actual formal airship declaration before we'll let you sell this property. So it depends. Uh, there's also a small estate affidavit. And if the estate is small enough, we might be doing that. Another option, 
muniment of title is a way of transitioning a assets when somebody had a last will, but we don't need a formal administration. In that case, we'd be waiting, you know, the few four to six weeks it takes to get a hearing uh, here in Harris County, Texas. Other counties, it may be faster to get in front of the court to move things forward. But once you're done with that hearing, you get an order and you can go collect assets. So the answer to how long does probate take here in Texas, it's going to depend on a lot of factors based on how you've set things up. It can be very fast if we don't, you know, we're relying on beneficiary designations. It could take a long time if there's no last will or if we're filing an estate tax return. All right, next question. Can I do probate on my own or do I have to have an attorney? Well, this is going to depend on how much probate work do we need to do. If you have to go in front of the court for some sort of hearing, if you're getting a fiduciary appointed like an executor or an administrator, yep, you're going to need an attorney to help you. Why? The way the rules and the laws are set up here in Texas, an executor or a uh, administrator is representing not only their own interests, they're representing, they're responsible for the interests of all of the beneficiaries. For that reason, you've got to have an attorney to make sure you're not just taking the money and putting it right in your pocket and doing what you want to with it. This is how things are set up. What could you do by yourself? Well, beneficiary designations going and collecting assets, you don't need an attorney necessarily to do that. You won't necessarily need an attorney to help you with the forms if you're without a last will and using the affidavit of airship to transfer title to a car to someone who's entitled to it. Also, the small estate affidavit, if you can get all the heirs of the estate together, if you can fill that out for yourself, sure, you don't need an attorney to sign off on that. You will need a notary who's going to make sure that you know everybody's signing under oath when they provide that information. I'll tell you, having worked with families and seen a lot of small estate affidavits over the years, it can get confusing because they're using terms you know, that seem so simple. Community property, separate property, who owns what? Yes, uh, these seem so simple, and yet it may be something that somebody could mess up. I've also seen a number of families that put together a small estate affidavit, and whether or not intentional, they've left off one of the heirs because they didn't like that person so much, or they just didn't want to get him to sign and take a share of the assets. This is a big problem because if you need more, you know, look, the court's not going to come in and necessarily, you know, grill everybody about the small estate affidavit. But if there's a mistake, if something comes back later, I've turned down clients who have filed incomplete, inconsistent, intentionally wrong small estate affidavits and said, look, you've lied under oath on this initial filing. I really don't feel like cleaning that up. So it's important to get it right. So so that you're not creating bigger problems. So no, an attorney is not always necessary. It just may be helpful. When can you do it yourself without an attorney? Collecting beneficiary designations, using forms provided by the state of Texas to go transfer assets to cars, and that small state affidavit. Next question. What is probate litigation and when do we need it here in Texas? Probate litigation is, you know, Probate litigation is going to be when we are filing a lawsuit to get something determined by the court. Most of the times we're spending this money, and it's usually about 10% of the assets that are available, to fight over what somebody meant. You know, I think the will says this, but you think the will says something different. I think I'm entitled to this, but you think the will says that you get it all. I think the will says that I get this outright. You say that there needs to be a trust so that you can't just go spend all that money on Maseratis and cigarettes. These are the sorts of problems that get created by wills that are drafted out there. This is what we can go, you know, have to go fight about. Additionally, this could apply to, you know, whether or not somebody is actually a beneficiary or an heir of an estate. Was somebody actually married to somebody else when they passed? You know, is there a common law spouse? Here in Texas, we do have common law marriage, and the benefit and the burden of common law marriage is you don't know if you were married or not. There's not a piece of paper that says, you know, we went to the courthouse and got married on this date. It's we were living together. We held ourselves out as married. Ta-da, you're married. But there's no common law divorce. So those common law spouses are entitled to 
assets kind of as a matter of course. So whenever there's something that everybody doesn't agree on, that's when we look at litigation. You occasionally could go to court for, I'll say litigation because we do have a lawsuit to, that we're thinking about, but the way to think about it is we're asking the court for guidance. So it may not be adversarial. Nobody may be fighting. We just need everybody involved to get on board, ask the court for clarity around how to read this. What should we do? Can we modify this? Technically, that is a type of litigation, but it's not adversarial. So lots of reasons. Usually it's we need clarity or we're looking to resolve a dispute between people when it comes to what a document says or who's entitled to something. What happens to the estate's assets during the probate process? Here's the problem. Between the time that somebody dies and an executor, fiduciary, personal representative is appointed, nobody really has the authority to deal with those assets. It's a gray zone, in what I call occasionally the land of frozen assets. Nobody has the authority to go in and say, that's mine or I'm dealing with this on behalf of the estate. So you can't sell property. If you've got bank accounts and you've got multiple owners, the bank is likely going to freeze the account until somebody gets appointed because they're protecting their backside. They don't want, you know, somebody died. We're freezing this until the we know who is in charge of this account. And even if you have spouses, spouses as co-owners of an account, banks will freeze that account, freeze the spouse out of the account. And then you're left scrambling for weeks, possibly months, waiting for an, uh, a fiduciary to be appointed for the estate. This is a problem. So, you know, here we're in this gray zone where nobody's really responsible and nobody has the authority to take over and deal with those assets. This is why we want to think about making sure we've got beneficiaries set up on assets, if we can use that, joint tenancy with rights of survivorship on some of the accounts to ensure that there's continual uh, a continual ability to deal with those assets. This is what happens. You know, until there's a fiduciary, nobody has the authority, so they can just kind of sit there. We may want to think about a temporary dependent administration if you're worried about you know, making payroll, collecting asset, you know, collecting other assets that may waste, you know, if, if you don't take care of something, if somebody doesn't have the authority to deal with it, that could be a problem. This is one of the problems with probate and we want to identify during our planning process because nobody's going to have the authority to deal with it between the time that somebody dies and somebody is appointed. Once you've got that fiduciary appointed though, well, they're responsible for it. They're the ones who have to go collect those assets, pay any bills, then make distributions. The executor, the administrator will be responsible for those assets and will need to let the beneficiaries of the estate know what's going on with it before they're distributed to them. All right. Next up, how do I avoid probing? Now, this is a question we get a lot. People want to, you know, they come into us saying, well, we want to avoid probate. We know probate's terrible. In states like New York, California, and Florida, it's true. Probate takes a very long time. It can cost you a lot of money, and it's something to be avoided. Here in Texas, we have independent administration. This ends up speeding the process along. We also have a procedure called immunement of title. So if there is a last will and there's nothing really to do, we're not paying these big fees. We're not doing much other than going to court once, having the judge you know, say that this is the official last will. And then we've got an order saying, you know, any assets that are out there, we can just go collect them. The will is valid. Here we are. So avoiding probate in Texas, it's something we think about, but it is not a top tier goal because probate's not so awful here. How can you avoid it? Things like beneficiary designations. It says when you pass, this is the person who will be entitled to it. It's effectively a contract between the account owner and the account custodian, you know, the bank or uh, investment company saying, when I die, give it to this person. The problem with beneficiary designations is if you set somebody up and they have either passed or they're in incapacitated and can't properly manage those assets, we may be 
causing bigger problems. You know, if you have your minor children set up as beneficiaries of your accounts, we're going to be looking at a bigger problem called a guardianship, which can cost tens of thousands of dollars in the first year to set that up for a minor child. And then when they're 18, whatever's left in those accounts goes to them immediately outright. And then there you are, an 18 year old with beneficiary of an account, it's going to get turned into fabric. It's going to get turned into Fabergé eggs, Maseratis, and cigarettes about 15 minutes later, which probably isn't what you had in mind for your kids. You want to make sure it's there, it's invested, and they use it for their education, use it to get a good start in life, not get blown on whatever an 18-year-old would spend it on. So avoiding probate is one thing you can do with beneficiary designations, but we want to make sure it's set up right. Another way to do this, having that revocable living trust Again, it takes time and effort to get those set up and properly funded. For most folks, we're not saying, hey, let's do this now. It's, it's an option. We talk about it with our clients. When clients still have young kids, we think about this, but a lot of our clients just don't need that yet. You know, Once you get beyond retirement age, if we're worried about a fight in probate, you know, this beneficiary may be more or less likely to uh, challenge a will or claim assets that don't belong to them. We may think about it there. So there are a lot of options for taking assets out of probate and avoiding probate. Here in Texas, though, the process is not as difficult as it is in New York, California, Florida, where there are mandatory fees for the executors and mandatory uh, filing fees that can be you know, up to 3% of the estate. We look at this as, you know, I understand why it's a problem in other states. Here in Texas, it's not the end of the world. So we think about it, how can we minimize the sting of probate, but we're not looking to eliminate it entirely. Well, that's all the questions we have this time. Thanks so much for dropping by. We will see you in a couple weeks for our next live stream.